there are two nutrients that almost everyone with Hashimoto's is deficient in unless they're supplementing. Those two nutrients are iron and vitamin D. Why do we care if someone's deficient in vitamin D? Well, vitamin D is anti-inflammatory and there's numerous studies to show that vitamin D is really important in people with Hashimoto's. In fact, there's research showing that vitamin D supplementation at the right dose can lower antibodies, make people feel better. And I can tell you from my own practice, roughly 95 of people with Hashimoto's that I see that aren't already taking vitamin D are deficient or have a level that I don't think is very good. So what's, what's deficient mean? Well, if you look at the lab reports, they'll say something like insufficient is from like 25 to 30 or 20 to 30 nanograms per milliliter. And then deficient is under 20. I mean, functionally speaking, if your vitamin D is 30 or less, it's not good. And really for my purposes, I need it to be substantially higher than that. So if you look at a blood test on vitamin D and your vitamin D is 28, that's too low. In my opinion, if it's 38, that's too low. But again, that's if you were under my care and I was taking care of you. Vitamin D is anti-inflammatory. It's regulatory. We know it's very important for people with Hashimoto's. But how do they become deficient in vitamin D? Well, a lot of people will say, well, I'm out in the sun and that, that should be fine, right? I shouldn't need to take vitamin D. Well, not so, not so fast. In people with autoimmune conditions and people with Hashimoto's, low vitamin D is kind of like part of the genetic package. And I can tell you that from my experience, if someone's got low vitamin D with Hashimoto's, we supplement them and their vitamin D goes up. When they stop taking the vitamin D, their vitamin D goes right back down, whether they're out in the sun or not. A sun exposure is great and important, but it's not going to correct a vitamin D deficiency in Hashimoto's patients, at least none of the ones that I've ever seen over the last 20 years. And as far as I know, there's really not anything in the, in the literature to say that sun exposure is going to take care of all that. Testing for vitamin D, definitely got a test for it. I don't recommend at all that you just take vitamin D blindly because you don't know how much to take. You don't know what your baseline is. Uh, and I really don't recommend you do that. I really think you should be working with someone that understands how to test vitamin D, you know, how to monitor it, and also won't freak out if your vitamin D gets into the 80s because uh, 80s is not like a toxic level. And in, in my opinion, 80s is a, a really good level for someone that has an autoimmune condition. Uh, notice I didn't talk about, hey, take this amount or take this supplement because I really don't think you should be doing it yourself because you can OD on vitamin D. Yes, vitamin D is fat soluble. You can hold on to that and it can cause some problems. You know, the chances of that are not great, uh, but I can tell you that you probably shouldn't be doing it yourself. I know it's a vitamin, but really it's a neurosteroid and it's fat soluble, so I don't recommend you do it on your own. You want to find someone that knows how to test, knows what levels to look for, knows how to supplement, what forms, what dose, and have that as part of an overall strategy to deal with the Hashimoto's problem. Okay, that's vitamin D. Okay, here's the second nutrient that most people with Hashimoto's are deficient in, and that is iron. So why do we care about iron? Well, iron is what we call an essential nutrient, and it affects thyroid hormones in a lot of different ways. And I made some other videos on this, but I'll just kind of summarize it for you. So iron is essential to make hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin is how you carry oxygen to your tissues. So if you have low hemoglobin, that's anemia, uh, and that can produce a lot of different symptoms like fatigue and weakness, you know, and uh, you know, malaise and problems with stamina. But iron is also needed to make energy itself, ATP. So again, if you have an iron deficiency or not enough iron, you're going to have problems with fatigue and have problems with energy. Iron is also necessary to make a couple different neurotransmitters, primarily dopamine. So if you don't have enough dopamine, you're going to have problems with mood. Also, iron is actually necessary to make thyroid hormones. Iron is a cofactor for that enzyme thyroid peroxidase. And if you don't have enough iron, you're probably not going to make enough hormones. So there's a, several different ways iron impacts uh, Hashimoto's and thyroid production. I'll tell you one bonus reason. Iron is necessary to have good hair. So if your ferritin levels, which is how you test iron, are below 70, that's enough of a risk factor in itself to be causing hair loss. So I mentioned ferritin. Well, ferritin is the test you do to determine uh, what someone's iron levels are. I know this gets a little bit confusing because ferritin is your best indicator of iron. It reflects about 22% of your body's iron. Now, if you look on a blood test where it says iron, that right there only reflects about 1% of your body's iron. So practically speaking, it's not that helpful. So you look at ferritin. Now, here's the other thing about ferritin though. On the lab ranges, you're going to see a ridiculously wide lab range. Like, 10 to 150 or like 15 to 150. I think that's a, a ridiculous range. Now the research literature that's been out there has said that if you're under 50 in your ferritin, that's a risk factor for fatigue by itself. And I'm just telling you, 15, 16, 20, that is not a good healthy level of ferritin in my opinion. 
over the last 20 years doing this, uh, a lot of Hashimoto's patients are in that teen level or in that 20s level, and that is not good for all those reasons I just talked about. So many different symptoms can come from that. But how do you become deficient in iron anyway? Well, it's kind of hard, but you know, for example, some people that are at risk for developing iron deficiency are people who are vegan, people who are vegetarian. But here's another way that you can come, become deficient in iron if you have Hashimoto's. The inflammation that comes along with Hashimoto's, because Hashimoto's is an inflammatory problem, that inflammation can impair your ability to absorb iron. And what that can lead to over time is decreased ferritin levels reflected on your blood. There's also malabsorption that can be in the picture because a lot of people with Hashimoto's have additional autoimmune problems. Some of those attack their small intestine. It creates a malabsorption problem where you have a problem absorbing iron. Uh, the point is, it's kind of hard to become deficient in iron unless you just don't eat it, like if you are vegan or vegetarian. Otherwise, there's something going on there and you maybe you don't make enough stomach acid. So the reason I'm telling you about all those possible causes uh, for ferritin being low is because you really can't figure it out on your own. I mean, yeah, if your ferritin was low, you could take iron, but again, I don't recommend you do that because you can OD on iron. You can take too much of it. So you need to be working with someone that understands that situation, right? What form of iron? How much? When should you take it? When should you not take it? How should you take it for maximum absorption? But beyond all that, why is your ferritin low? There's a lot of people running around that say that they, you know, do functional medicine, but here's the extent of it. Uh, they do a ferritin test and the ferritin is low and they say, hey, take iron. And that's it. That's functional medicine. That's not functional medicine. Functional medicine should be taking many degrees further than that and try to figure out why is it low if we can figure it out. So what's your goal for ferritin? I mean, typically if you're a cycling woman, you need to be at least 50 for a couple of months with supplementation. And then we try to see how you do without supplementation. But again, I don't recommend you do it yourself because you can take too much. So what are the two nutrients most people with Hashimoto's are deficient in? Iron and vitamin D. We talked about how each of those is important, uh, not only to your overall health, but to Hashimoto's specifically. We talked about how to get tested for it. We did not talk about supplementing because I don't want you to do that yourself. I think you need to work with someone who knows how to do that and knows how to take the iron and the vitamin D situation into a bigger picture as an overall strategy for dealing with Hashimoto's and wants to get to the root of the problem, not just putting a Band-Aid on it. So I hope you guys found that helpful and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good one.